Here is where I usually give a sermon, and we have been in uh, the Old Testament book of Genesis, but we're actually going to take a break from that. Um, today's sermon um, is, is still a sermon of sorts, but it's a little different. Um, instead of a, a typical sermon the way that I've been doing it, um, I'm going to actually just tell a story, the whole service I'm going to tell a story. But, but it is still a sermon. And um, well, I'm going to actually start with the Word of God, and then we'll, we'll get into a story. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. God works all things out for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. God redeems all things. Redeems meaning he works them out for good. For everyone? Not for everyone. That's not what it says. For those who are called according to his purpose. And, and, and what does it mean that he works out everything for, for good? What do, you, what do you mean by for good? Well, well, it says it right in there. In verse 29 it says... For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. All things God redeems, as in he works them out to shape us, to look more like Jesus, to live like Jesus. And, and there's more in verse 30. Those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Our story. All things. All things God works together in our lives for the purpose of glory. God redeems bad things. And he works them out to conform us, to make us look like Jesus, and for glory. And that's the story I'm going to tell today. That's all of our stories, but that's the story I'm going to tell today, the story of a man where God worked out bad things for good, for glory, for shaping this man to look like him, to represent him, and, 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 and for glory. So I'm going to tell that story. Uh, first I'm going to pray. I'm going to go right into it. Okay. Uh, Father God, I pray that you guide my words to glorify yourself, to show the glory that you did uh, in my friend. And I would ask that this story would, would draw people to you and you would truly show yourself um, in, a, in an awesome, mighty way as you are still calling people, Lord. Um, do that in your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay. Uh, July 7th, 2018. I was camping with my family in the Door County Peninsula of Wisconsin in a camper that someone had given us. And uh, I had a, a missed call on my phone. I wasn't really answering my phone. I had a missed call, and I saw that it was from the police department and a voicemail. And I thought to myself, all right, what now? <laughs> I thought to myself, okay, um, who is in prison now, or who just got picked up by the police and is calling me? There's a lot of people in, in our church that I, I had to worry about, so to speak, <laughs> where I thought, okay, it could be this person. Maybe this person got in trouble with their probation officer, and, you know, they're reaching out. I had all these scenarios of why the police might be calling me, and I'm, like, thinking that I don't really want to deal with this right now. I don't want to think about it on vacation, but I, I called the voicemail, and, uh, and the man said, this is officer so-and-so. Um, we are with uh, a member of your church, Janet Lafine, and there's been an accident, and her husband is dead. And I remember just yelling out, no. No, that can't be. Even as I was saying it, I, I knew that it was true. Um, you 
let me rewind, actually. Let me rewind some years earlier. Um, 2012. 2012, we're beginning our first church plant, and we rented out a little storefront, and we were doing these things called cafe nights at night, where we'd have some worship and a message and discussion. Really small group of ragtag folks. And this couple in their early 50s uh, started coming. Landon and Janet Lafine. And uh, I remember they came up to me after a couple weeks of just checking out. They came up to me and they said, yeah, we've been part of this big church for years. And we just felt like we were called to something different. And you're different. <laughs> I just remember the way he said it. <laughs> And they basically said, we, we want to be part of, of this. We're drawn to, to what's happening here. And they jumped right in. You know, we were a brand new church. We had a, a, a good handful of young people. And so it was really great to have some people with a little more uh, maturity in life. And uh, they, they jumped right in. You know, uh, Landon and Janet were part of our homeless ministry that we were doing. Uh, Landon... Uh, Jumped in and played bass with the band. He played every single Sunday because we didn't have that many musicians. He played every Sunday, and um, musicians uh, have a reputation of being a little flaky <laughs> and maybe noncommittal. Um, well, that was the case with our musicians, anyways, but not Landon. Uh, you know, at his funeral, our worship leader said that Landon was my rock, the guy that I could always depend on being there. And, you know, that was. That was true for so many things. We had this weekly prayer night that we would do, and you know, even as the church grew, there was only a really small group of people that would come to the prayer night. A lot of times it was just six people or so. Um, but I always knew that Landon and Janet would be there. On Thursday nights, Landon and Janet would be there to pray. And uh, there were times when Landon... And Janet were there when no one else was. I remember a time when I was trying to gather the whole church to meet on a Saturday morning. We were about to launch Awana, which is a children's ministry. And, and I thought, let's go door to door downtown and find uh, families and let them know that they can, you know, just walk their children over for Awana. And um, so I invited the whole church to do that. And on Saturday morning, Landon and Janet were the only ones that showed up. And we did that. So, um, you know, that's, that's the life he was living. And, and there was more. I mean, if you would go to their house, if you would knock on their door, Janet and Landon, Landon you don't know who was going to answer the door. Because at any given time, they had different people living with them. If, uh, you know, if there's a, a young guy in the church who, for whatever reason, found himself homeless... You know, that would be the go-to place where they would go and live. It, it was kind of a joke, you know. We'd call it uh, Landon and Janet's home for, you know, wayward young men. It was, it was kind of a joke, you know, but I, I could think of now at least six different times where that happened. Someone needed a place to live, that's where they would go. And I thought of about these things that he did, these ways that he served, and I realized that it's not enough for me to communicate really who he was to us, who he was to our church. And there, there was an image in my head, a, a memory, that maybe, maybe uh, shares this a little better, paints the picture a little better. Um, when we did get the news uh, that he died, so many of us, you know, that night we went to the church, that night, um, just to be near each other and to pray. And I remember when I walked in, um, I saw this kid, Colton, 12 years old or so, uh, this red-haired, tough kid. He, he, he acted tough. Uh, Colton, um, Colton's mom, Colton's mom, about six years earlier when we started the church, Colton's mom uh, left a life of drugs and uh, brought, you know, her son and her daughter, and they became part of the church. Later, Colton's dad got out of prison, and uh, he stuck around for a short amount of time and then went back to the life he was living. So Colton didn't really have a dad. 
And, you know, if you grow up without a dad, I've observed that that, that does something to a kid. That creates a, a, a longing and a wound. And a lot of times these kids, they, they act tough because they're not tough. And that was Colton. He was a, a tough kid. Grew up without a dad. And, and I, I walk in and I see this tough 12-year-old kid just crying and crying and weeping. And uh, crying and crying and crying. And that's who Landon was. Because Landon was a father to the fatherless. Um, Landon also grew up without a dad. So maybe he knew what that was like. And um, Landon understood something. What Jesus purchased for us what he did on the cross. If you remember his dying wish, what he said, I think you find this in John 19. Uh, his mom was there at the side of the cross, and so was his friend, his disciple John. And he said, Woman, behold, your son. Behold, your mother. As in his dying wish is that we would be family. Landon understood that the church was a family and he was, he was a father to so many of us. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I told the whole story of Landon's life at his funeral, as I'm telling you much of the story now. And God knew, of course, what he had planned. And it's interesting because it was really just like, oh, some weeks, uh, a month, maybe a little more before Landon died, that me and him decided to go fishing together in this old little boat that I had. And that's when he really told me his whole story. The, I, I knew parts, but that's when he really told me everything. Uh, Landon grew up in California. Uh, his dad wasn't around. His mom had boyfriends and husbands, um, you know, come in and out of the picture. And Landon didn't get along with some of them. And at the age of 16, he left and he never came back. He left home, got himself a car, and he was gone. And he found himself a group of friends, he told me. He said, these guys, they were dangerous. That's what he said. And he was one of them, for sure. He said, wild and dangerous. Uh, drugs and guns. And the like. And he just dove in head first into this life as a, as a kid, a young man maybe, age 16. And, and he lived this way for years. And, uh, well, one Sunday morning, he uh, went with a, a girl he knew, brought him to a church. Um, a small Pentecostal church, he wandered in, and he heard this message about God who is a father. A God who wants us to be his children. God who wants us to be part of his family. Heard this message of the news of forgiveness and new life through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Our sins atoned for, our punishment paid. And new life in him, a gift. He heard this message in Landon, a troubled, wild, dangerous young man, heard this message and he believed. You know, reached up his arm to God and he said, save me, and he believed. 
Perhaps you've read the kingdom of God comes in like a mustard seed. That's how it is sometimes. Mustard seed, very small. Jesus said this. The kingdom of God comes in like a mustard seed, barely noticeable at first. But it grows. And that's how it was. The mustard seed came in. Landon had this faith. But there was still a lot of weeds and, and thorns and thistles trying to choke out the seed. He was still living a, a dangerous life. Even as he had this, this faith growing within him. Uh, he tried to be a good dad to his two boys. You know, tried to live for God in some ways, but old habits die hard. Old ways of living sometimes don't go away overnight. And Landon is still living a, a, a wild and, and dangerous life. And it came to a head one evening. Landon got very angry at a certain woman, and he grabbed a shotgun. He went to her house with the full intent of taking her life. He told me that he went in, he aimed the shotgun at her, and he said, right then, uh, the Holy Spirit stopped me and showed me he said, the Holy Spirit showed me of what would happen, what it would look like if I pulled that trigger and said to him, is this what you want? And he stopped, he put the gun down, and he left. And as you can imagine, uh, the police picked him up. And it wasn't his only offense, you know. It wasn't his, his only time breaking the law. So he went away. Uh, they sent him first to... You know, the infamous San Quentin prison. And, uh, well, actually, he would be in prison for seven years. And also the way that Landon would say it was this. He said, I am thankful for my time in prison. Wow, seven years. Seven years in prison. He said, I, I am thankful for my time in prison because in prison, I learned to study God's word. Wow. What does it mean to seek the Lord? All who seek, find. You ever hear that? All who seek, find. And I've said that. Maybe you've heard it from Jesus reading the scriptures. All who seek, find. What does it mean to seek? Here's something. Here's something it means. Go to the Bible and read it. Study, seek, as, as if you're looking for hidden treasure, because in it you will find hidden treasure. Landon said he was thankful for his time in prison. He found treasure in God's word. And perhaps the Lord has you in a prison of sorts, a, a prison of suffering. Don't waste that. Take Landon's advice. Study God's word, and you too will be able to look back and you'll say, I, I'm thankful for that time of suffering, of hardship. So in prison, Landon learned to study God's word. He also learned how to play bass and join the, the, the prison church band. And eventually he became uh, the assistant to the chaplain. Meanwhile, on the other side of the country in Wisconsin, um, Janet Jensen, a single mom of two boys, plucked a, a card off of a tree. And on the card, it said, Michael Lafine, Landon Jr. So, um, let me explain. It was a ministry called Angel Tree, where what Angel Tree would do was uh, they would have people take these cards, and the, and the card would belong to a, it would have the name of a child whose parents were incarcerated. And if you got a card, you would buy Christmas presents for that child in the name of the incarcerated parent. Um, as a way of keeping, you know, children connected with their parents, because their parents can't send them Christmas presents. 
So Janet and her boys did that. They got presents for this, this young man. Um, and typically, you just kind of bring the presents to the church and let the church, you know, bring the presents to the boy. But uh, Janet uh, and her boy, for whatever reason, God put it in their hearts where they wanted to meet the boy and they wanted to give the presents to him. And they did. They gave the presents to him, and that started a relationship. Landon's, or Janet's son began giving dr- drum lessons to Landon's son. And, well, some things uh, progressed, and eventually Landon was let out of prison, and he moved to Wisconsin to be near his boy. Um, he met Janet, and um, the way that Janet would say it is, right away we were inseparable. Uh, they became best friends, um, and, and they, they fell in love and, and were married. And they were living as Christians. They were, they were Christians. Um, and, you know, some years later is when they wandered into Downtown Mission Church, as I told you, in 2012, and, and jumped right in. Um, but, and I, I shared part of this last week, but there were still things in Landon's life that were holding him back a little bit. He was living as a Christian, uh, the dangerous choices of his previous life had, had, had pretty much fallen away, but there was still something holding him back. And uh, as, it, as it was, he had a, a drinking problem. I didn't even really know it, but he had a drinking problem. Uh, it was causing problems in his life. His, his wife knew it. And uh, well, he had a dream. And I, I didn't even know about that uh, at the time. He had a dream. And he, he came to me, and like I told you last week, he quoted the verse where Jesus said at the Last Supper, I'm not going to drink of the fruit of the vine again until I do it with you in my Father's kingdom. That's what Jesus said. I'm not going to drink wine again until I do it with you in my Father's kingdom. And Landon said, I'm not going to drink any alcohol either until I do it with Jesus. When Jesus does it, then I'll do it. He said, I'm not giving it up permanently. I really like to drink. I'm not giving it up permanently. I'm just going to give it up until Jesus returns. And I thought, that's pretty cool, Landon. (laughs) Uh, I don't think you came up with that by yourself. (laughs) That's a pretty profound way of looking at it. But I got the whole story from his brother, uh, I mean from his son uh, at the funeral. I was talking to his son or before the funeral, that is. I was talking to his son, and uh, his son told me, yeah, he was talking to his dad on the phone. And he said, uh, Dad, how's the beer making going? Because Landon would make beer. And Landon said, oh, I got rid of all that. I gave it away. Uh, I- I'm not doing that anymore. And, uh, and his son said, what? Uh, you love making beer. Why would you get rid of it? And what he said was, I had a dream. And Jesus said to me, that I needed to be ready, that I wasn't ready and I needed to be ready. And I thought that was amazing when his son told me that because in the last, you know, days of Landon's life, in the last months and years, that was like this, this theme, this message he always carried. Um, be ready. In fact... One of the last elder meetings, Landon became an elder. One of the last elder meetings we had before he died, I remember distinctly that Landon went off on a tangent. (laughs) He went off on a rant, actually. I remember it because I was annoyed (laughs) because we were trying to discuss, you know, matters of, of business and things that we had to attend to. And Landon is on this rant, like preaching to all of us, the rest of the elders. And he just kept saying, like, we need to be ready. We need to be ready, and we need to make sure other people are ready. As in, I don't know if you know what I'm saying. Like, Jesus, Jesus said, be ready because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you don't expect. Um, be ready. So when Jesus finds you, he finds you ready and waiting. Be ready. And so, 
So uh, he said he was saying to us, like, we need to be ready. We need to be ready. And I remember thinking, like, Landon, we have business to attend to. We're all the elders. We all know this. But I look back on it, and I'm like, uh, I think that's a message that we still need to hear. We need to be ready. And so that was like this theme, like, be ready, be ready, be ready to meet Jesus. And um, around that time of his life, um, that he, you know, he gave up drinking, his life like shot into like hyperspeed. His spiritual life shot into hyperspeed, and he was just consumed with this call to make people ready to meet Jesus. He was working at this factory, okay? He had been there, I believe, uh, like seven years. And he started feeling a uh, discontent. I would call it a, a holy discontent or just a stirring, a calling from God to be doing something different. And I didn't get this story until after he died. His, his wife, Janet, told me all this. He was at work, and he was praying about doing something different, feeling like he was called to something different. And there was this coworker that never talked to him. And for whatever reason, Landon put out a fleece for God. A fleece is from the book of Judges. If, if you think, you know, God is calling you to something, you can put out a fleece for God to confirm it. And so he, he put out a fleece, and he said, that guy over there, God, that guy that never talks to me, if you want me to quit this job, I want him to come over and talk to me. I don't know why Landon prayed that, but that's what he prayed. And apparently at lunch, the guy walked by him, stopped, turned around, and came over and started chatting with Landon. And Landon, of course, was like, wow, God. But just like Gideon in the story of Judges with the fleece, Landon, you know, his faith was still (laughs) wavering. And so he prayed to God, okay, God, that was impressive, but I need you to do that again. (laughs) Have him walk over and talk to me again. And then I'll pull the trigger. And that's exactly what happened. The same guy came over and chatted with Landon again. And that very day, Landon went into his boss's office and quit. And like I said, I didn't get that story until, you know, before, you know, the funeral. uh, Janet told me that part of the story. I just remember talking to Landon, and he told me that he quit his job without another job lined up. And I remember saying, that's kind of (laughs) weird, you know, like, um, like Landon, you could have waited until you got another job, and, uh, well, he didn't explain all that to me. He just was like, I feel called to quit the job, and so, so he quit the job, and uh, eventually he applied for a position to be head of maintenance for the YMCA, and we were all praying that he would get this job for whatever reason, you know, I think God just put it on our heart that this is where he wanted Landon to be. And so we were all praying that he would get this position as head of maintenance for the YMCA. And we actually had this faith that he was going to get it. And, um, and they had it narrowed down to two people. And then I remember seeing Landon on a Thursday night, I think it was. And, um, and I was like, what's going on with the YMCA? And, you know, Landon said with a smile, uh, They called and they said they went in another direction. And, you know, we were really disappointed. But I remember being more than just disappointed. I remember feeling like, no, that's not right. You know, like Jesus said, whatever you pray for, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. I felt like I I had this faith that he was going to get it. And so I, I was kind of just confused, like, how could he not get it? So I remember still feeling that way. And I talked to another one of the elders and we had both, felt the same way, like, this isn't right, like, uh, like he's supposed to get that job, and sure enough, you know, the next day or two later, uh, the YMCA calls him, and they said, yeah, it didn't work out with this other guy, we want to offer you the job, and so I tell you that God had his hand in landing, getting this particular job, because um, this is where he would serve God, and this is where he would die. Um, it was, for the last three years of his life, this was uh, this 
all-consuming mission that he had. He was, he was head of maintenance, but it was, it was more than a job for him. It was a calling. He went to work as a missionary. I've talked with you guys about that before. Going to your jobs, your places in life as missionaries. He went as a missionary. And he was always praying for his coworkers and specifically always praying for his boss. I know how many times I heard him pray for his boss, Brian. He would tell about what his boss was going through, and he was always praying for his coworkers and his boss. And at the YMCA, he would meet these different people, people like members coming in. Um, I remember, like I would meet people at his funeral, and they said, I just knew Landon because I was a member of the YMCA, and I would talk to him when I went in. Because Landon wore his faith on his sleeve. Literally, he wore his faith on his sleeve. He would always wear these Christian t-shirts. Some of them were really cheesy, to be honest, but he would always wear these Christian t-shirts. At his funeral, they were all on display. He would always wear these Christian t-shirts just as a way to strike up conversations with people. Oh, what does your shirt say? And boom, you know, Landon is, is sharing the gospel. Um, And, uh, well, what happened was um, there was one night where Landon didn't come home from work. And um, Janet was at home, and that boy, the red-haired kid that I told you about, he was there at their house. And he was saying to Janet, let's just go there. Let's just go to the YMCA. I don't know why he's not coming home or answering the phone. Let's just go there. And Janet uh, said no. Um, you know, she'll tell you. She said, I knew that something was very wrong, and I knew that I needed to get sleep um, to deal with what was going on. So she didn't go to the Y, or she didn't call anyone that night. She just went to bed. And early the next morning, she drove over to, over to the Y and uh, saw his motorcycle parked there. You know, it's interesting. Just a couple years before he died, he cashed in his retirement, his 401k, and bought a Harley Davidson motorcycle. And at the time, it was like, Landon, that's not very responsible. <laughs> uh, perhaps the Lord knew that he wasn't going to need his retirement in the, in the usual way. Uh, anyway, she saw his, his motorcycle at the Y and, uh, you know, contacted someone about what's going on, and they found him um, slumped over on a ladder. He had been changing out a, a light bulb, a light fixture, and he got electrocuted. And, um, well, two days after he died, it was a Sunday morning, Two days after he died, it was a Sunday morning, and there was this guy at church with a suit, and I knew that he was a first-time person because there wasn't a lot of people at our church that would dress up, and he was wearing a suit, and so after the service, you know, I went and found him, hey, nice to meet you, you know, and this guy's, you know, got tears in his eyes, and he said, I lived across the street from Landon. He kept telling me to come visit this place, and I wish I would have done it earlier. And he said to me, the last conversation I had with Landon, the last conversation I had with Landon, Landon said to me, Dave, uh, do you think that you are worthy of God? Do you think you are worthy of going to heaven? And he said, I, 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 I just paused for a second and said, well, I don't know. And he said, and Landon said, guess what? You're not. <laughs> but God loves you anyways, Dave. And he wants you to know that. He wants you to know that's why he sent Jesus. And in the coming days, just like that, in the coming days, on Sunday morning, who started coming to our church? Landon's friends, his co-workers, his family members. I could start listing people 
coworkers, family members, friends, people that didn't even know him but were at his funeral who joined our church and got baptized. And, and to this day, the head of maintenance at our church back home is Landon's boss, the guy that he prayed for so many times. God redeems bad things. And Landon's story of glory is not over. His funeral. My dad came to his funeral. My dad's not a believer. He doesn't like funerals. My dad avoids funerals. But he came to Landon's funeral, and I, I said to him, Dad, you ever been to a funeral like that before? And he said, no. <laughs> nope. And I knew what he meant. Because it wasn't a sad time. It was, there were tears, but it was a celebration. There was a spirit of joy there. I talked to someone at the funeral, and he said to me, this is the first time I've ever been to a funeral where I know 100% where this person is. Um, Romans 8 35 to 39 says it like this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The idea that Landon is dead is laughable to me. Landon Levine is not dead. (laughs) Those who believe in me, Jesus said, Though they die, will live. They will never die. Um, and I can think of nothing more exciting than having wine when Jesus returns at the feast with, with Jesus and with, with my friend Landon. And Landon's message for all of you, if he was here, he would say, be ready. And you'll be there also. Father God, I just pray that uh, the message uh, that you would like conveyed, Lord, the glory of who you are displayed in the story of a man who was redeemed uh, and conformed to your image, Lord, I pray that that uh, would be beheld by us, Lord, and we would know that the time is coming soon, soon. You are coming soon, Lord. Help us know that in our hearts and help us be ready and toss aside the sin that so easily clings to us and holds us down. Lord, help us be ready also, God, by the power of your spirit working in us. In your name, Jesus, amen.